righty. All right. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to see everybody's faces. Um, just to kind of introduce myself, I'm Corinne Pompey. I'm the program coordinator here at Woman Made. Um, and this is the Down There Artist panel. Uh, we have, uh, I'm just going to kind of introduce the flow of things. So um, basically, we're just going to have a discussion about the exhibition. Um, it's nothing super formal. So if you feel like uh, you hear something that you want to jump off of and kind of add an anecdote to, totally feel free to. It's not going to be a strict Q&A, um, just kind of a open conversation. Um, but for for those who are here and, um, oops, sorry. For those who are here and uh, kind of want to know more about our artists, I'm just going to do brief bios so that we're all kind of on the same page and know who you guys are. So first up, we have Kelsey Bogdan, who was our juror of the Down There exhibition. Um, Kelsey is an artist, scholar, and educator from Chicago who completed her BA at Harvard University, where she studied neuroscience as well as gender and sexuality. Um, and she hopes to integrate neuroscience, healing, and human resistance through her scholarship. We also have Sarah Eckstein, um, who is an artist from Western Maryland, currently pursuing her MFA at ISU, where she teaches photography. Her work is focused on her life and her body as they interact with chronic illness and healing. Um, then we have Kit Robbins, who's a queer, trans, and non-binary multidisciplinary artist based in Oakland who focuses primarily on woodworking and metalworking. Their work explores themes of identity, transformation, and societal perceptions and often challenges preconceived notions about gender and the relationship between genitalia and identity. And then we have Joanna Hoge, who is a queer artist and designer based in Denver, Colorado. They apply their background in psychology and interest in medicine to create works that explore this dynamic uh, between subjective identity and objectifiable body. And then we have Mackenzie Fitz, who recently graduated from SAIC with her BA in fine art. They utilize art as a facilitator for discussion and an instigator for pleasure. Their work is focused on the intersection of femininity and sexuality when interpreting identity. Okay, <laughs> so super excited to have all you guys here. Um, I think we're just gonna start off uh, with Kelsey. I kind of would love for you to explain your jurying experience, how that went for you, um, maybe some hardships, things that you were surprised by, um, and, and anything you're willing to share. Yeah, I'm sorry for the sound in the background right now. There's a truck outside. No worries. Uh, but yeah, I'm Kelsey Bogdan. I juried the show. And I just have to thank all of you so much for your work and practice. It's been unreal getting to just share in your work. I've read everyone's artist statement like three times. And I think that's honestly the strength of the show is just how much rigorous research goes into all of your practices like every single statement in the show it's talking about medical institutions talking about sociology talking about all these really complicated in-depth research topics and it's just really amazing all the work that went into all of these pieces both physically and conceptually um but yeah i ended up during the show because i originally showed it woman made right after my mfa um, out of Columbia, Chicago, right in the South Loop. Uh, and I got to show my work in the show called Age of a Bimbo, Age of the Bimbo at Woman Made. And I just got to know the team there and started talking about my work, which I have an 80 page thesis paper about, but in short, is just about joy as resistance and, you know, the power of joy in reclaiming bodies, space and time. So a large component of that work was researching the history of medicine and gynecology and the clitoris, uh, which is a major uh, area of my work. And I just started chatting with the team and they were like, let's do a show about this called Down There. And that's kind of how it was birthed. And I made the call for entries pretty open. Um, I just wanted to see what was out there and kind of let the work determine the ethos of the show, if that makes sense. Um, and we ended up getting about 500 entries, so 500 individual artworks I looked at to narrow it down to, correct me, Karina, is the 35? Yeah, there's 39. 39. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it took literally days to read through all the statements and try to narrow things down. But ultimately, I ended up leaning into the space of abstraction. So while the show is about vulvar anatomy, you'll notice that there's not any literal vulvas in the show. Everything is abstracted, which I think is really interesting, um, but also serves to highlight sort of the conceptual side behind all of your work. And from that space, I ended up narrowing it down to the work we have now. And it's really amazing. I have a whole web of ideas over here next to me, but literally the work in the show covers issues around hair, birth, aging, periods, medicalization of bodies, gender, femininity, trans and non-binary bodies, nature, vocabulary about the anatomy, education, storytelling, abuse, assault, trauma, and pleasure and joy. So literally we're covering a huge spectrum of ideas and topics within this show. Um, and it's just, I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to kind of take, you know, when you do your thesis, you have an exhibition, but you have a paper and that scholarly side is really important to me and to kind of have this opportunity to bring you all together and engage your amazing practices in this space. It's just been so special. So I can't thank the team at Women enough for just giving me this opportunity. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, we were really excited to have you jury the show. I think you have a really um, unique perspective and uh, something that is much needed, as do all of all of you guys. But uh, Kelsey, you kind of touched on this idea of how the body of work as a whole was kind of an intersection between research and vulnerability. So mm -hmm. I, I would love if all the artists can kind of touch on how vulnerability kind of plays a role in your practice and kind of informs your exploration of the down there topic. Um, I don't know who wants to start, um, but if somebody could, could take the lead here. I, I can could, start. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Pitt. I was just trying to ice break. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so when I, um, vulnerability plays like a big piece. Um, in my art, um, I think being an openly trans person like sort of requires tap tapping into vulnerability that like I never had before. Um, uh, the whole process was like just really raw for me. I made this piece and I definitely didn't think I was ever gonna show it in the show. I wasn't sure I was even gonna show it to another human. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just kind of, I don't know, it feels um, feels like a next step sort of in my kind of gender identity, I guess, and like relationship with my body to sort of openly talk about such a vulnerable topic. Um, I wasn't actually sure that I even belonged in this show. Um, I think based on the description of who was invited into the show, I wasn't sure that I was uh, someone who should be applying. Um, but ultimately I figured that since I, the show is like specifically about a body part that I own, um, I figured y'all could decide if you wanted me in it or not. Um, and I just wanted to like sort of challenge the idea that like, genitals really have anything to do with gender and I think categorizing genitals into like two categories can um, exclude like a lot of trans and intersex people. Yeah I, I agree Kit and a lot of my work on the clitoris I actually started to understand the clitoris kind of as a site of revolution in terms of breaking down that biological binary that science likes to uphold because and there's a couple pieces in the show that speak to this anatomy that's kind of honestly more of a spectrum than two distinct categories um because when someone is an embryo right you have this pluripotent track that could develop one way another and under certain cir circumstances some parts will be bigger some parts will be smaller and the clitoris wasn't fully mapped until 2005, I believe it was. So 
I think just by studying the clitoris more, we have so much room for conversation about how to deconstruct biological binaries because they're not really that real, especially when it comes to genitalia. And yeah, I just think that was such an important conversation to have within this show. So I really appreciate your work and your vulnerability. Thanks. I can jump in um, next. Tough facts to follow. That was really great. Um, Kid, I'm so excited I got to hear you talk more about um, your work. But I, uh, my piece um, is about struggling and having vaginismus and vestibulodynia, which are uh, sexual dysfunctions um, characterized in the vulvar anatomy. Um, and I've been making work about this for a while now, but I remember when I first started sharing it back in undergrad, how nerve wracking it was to basically present myself um, either through words or doing a lot of self portraiture and being like, I can't have sex. I have pain with this. My um, vagina is not functioning. Um, and it was really kind of hard to do that. But through making and sharing that work, I gained a lot of confidence from it. And now when I share it, I still do feel a little bit of the vulnerability, but I think for me, it's kind of transformed into a way where I hope my work can provide a safe enough space for others to um, be vulnerable with themselves with it. Because a lot of what propelled me to continue making the work that I do about it is I got so many messages from people, um, people that I've known for like decades and completely random people that have found my work um, on Instagram or through hashtags and mean like I have this I always thought I was alone um, and kind of like knowing like doing this in art um, and also just um, curating like communities like this um, brings a lot of people together and they can share those experiences that kind of we all have sometimes thought we're the only ones who are suffering from. Sarah I'm I meant to tell you this but actually there was a vaginismus specialist so a pelvic floor specialist who's in the show and read your artist statement and she was like I feel like I can understand my patients so much more now which is just really cool and I'm sorry I'm replying to everyone I'm just so excited to talk to you guys because I'm a, I'm a fangirl of everyone here um but I think just sharing those stories is so powerful and I think something that I struggle with being in med school now is like translating right how do we get information to people in a way that's accessible and digestible and can be spread around and shared and I think art has such a power to do that to educate and to just bring awareness to things so I think your work is super important even in a public health sense of connecting people to resources right and even putting names to things that they might not know have names for um, so yeah, I also really appreciate your vulnerability in your work. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, and kind of just on a, a personal note, I walked the show with uh, my brother's girlfriend the other day, who's also a public floor therapist, and she was really struck by your work personally, um, and she actually ended up taking a picture of it and sending it to a couple of her patients because she felt like they could really connect with it. Um, and so it just further proved just how important, you know, all that work is. So thank you. <laughs> um, my first thought was not about like what my art portrays for vulnerability, but like what I personally go through to make it. And this piece in particular was like a, it was a pretty defining moment for me. I did a similar piece a year ago, but the model had to be someone else. I couldn't like photograph myself. And with this piece, I had to make a decision of, I knew that um, my partner's family is very religious. Um, and just in general, people that I know, like putting this piece out there for me was going to be a defining moment of vulnerability of like, do I make the art and do I tell the message that I want to tell or do I worry about how other people are going to perceive it? But that is entirely the point of it. And the longer that I sat with this, um, I realized that I don't think of my work as being vulnerable because I think a lot of the times the messages I'm trying to tell, especially this one, are just like what it should be. Like that should be the message. That shouldn't be a vulnerable message. And it has a lot to do with like perspective for me 
I don't know if I worded that super great, but it's, I've also a similar thought process that I think I could illustrate is I've been thinking about penetration versus seclusion. Um, Seclusion is the word for like enveloping or bringing something in and just flipping those perspectives. So I I haven't thought about it as being vulnerable because I thought it was just the way that things should be. And that was the message I was trying to share. I definitely relate and agree with that as well. Um, I mean, I feel like submitting anything to a show and showing art is vulnerable in itself. Um, But I just felt like my piece, it was like, it kind of like forces you to look and it's not, it's like, it's kind of screams vagina, but at the same time, it's not really showing you anything at the same, like there's, there was a piece of fabric like blocking it so it's like it's showing but not showing at the same time and I don't know it's interesting seeing people's reactions to something like so spread open and yeah yeah I think this is something that I've really gone back and forth with in my own practice as well just like how much of yourself do you feel you need to share in your work and it's been a long process of me figuring out my own boundaries with that, right? Throughout art school, right? You're getting critiques on things that are super personal or, you know, traumatic for not just you, but others. And it can be weird, right? And I think for me, I got into this space of radical joy felt like a more, a space that I could operate in for a longer period of time than sharing my my pain directly but I think no matter what you're showing even if it is joy it's like we're all shaped by these things right but as an artist I think it's just always a a dialogue right I feel comfortable sharing this and maybe I don't feel comfortable sharing this and I don't know I I really value how vulnerable you all have been in your own practice as someone who's been on the other side of it too showing that work and then having to talk about it right and answer questions about it it can be a lot um so yeah, I, I appreciate all of you for that. I think Mackenzie's sentiment around like, you know, this feeling of like, it shouldn't be vulnerable. I think there's something in that for me and like making work about the vagina. It's like, it's our bodies, people. <laughs> Why is this still so socially stigmatized, you know? But I think I, you know, like I'm, I'm so psyched to be in this conversation and to very, feel very privileged to be exhibiting with you all. Um, I, I do really think there is a lot of bravery in exhibiting this kind of work that is and can be so personal, that has so many personal associations, especially in the midst of a society that continues to tell us that there's something that's not really right with our bodies and that kind of propagates this idea of you know, a vagina has to be shaved and sanitized in order to be acceptable. Um, So yeah, just looking at this work, I think there's a huge amount of bravery and vulnerability in it. And I think, you know, to think about like some of the research that like sociologist Brene Brown has done, when we make ourselves vulnerable, we open ourselves to connection. Um, And that's, you know, kind of what lights people up is like, oh, like I, you know, relating to that vulnerability. Um, it kind of opens the door for everything, for everyone else to see themselves in the work. And so I think that's been really strong in the show. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that not only does it, does vulnerability open you up to connection, but it can also open you up to judgment, you know, and that is what's really empowering about being vulnerable is because you're taking that chance. All of you took that chance and, um, I think it worked out. <laughs> I'd like to think so. Um, well, well, that was awesome. Thank you guys for sharing all of your guys' perspectives. Um, you guys briefly kind of talked about perspective. So I'm just kind of curious how your guys, how or did your guys' perspective of your own work change when you saw it in a gallery setting amongst the other works? I don't know if I would say my perspective changed as much as my perspective solidified um, 
if that makes sense and how great it was to be shown in an environment that had so many different like mediums and approaches but at the same time they all existed together with one another so it was really rewarding to see my work be included in that and I think having them all together kind of just like strengthened them that much more and then also being able to like have this conversation how we're all like see everybody's like head nodding in mind as everyone's talking and it's just really good being in um this environment where we all kind of understand these things yeah that's a really good point does anybody else want to jump off of that or are we all in agreement <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think something that changed, um, in my perspective was since sort of acknowledging, um, my authentic self, I have kind of felt a little like unsure of how I fit into spaces that are largely, um, like, women's spaces and like a gallery called women's made Gal women made gallery um and it like especially like throughout this conversation it it feels good to like be included and have community in that way um because yeah like I don't know I lived like a lot of years in sort of a similar um way so yeah it's been interesting to see all the different uh art yeah that's that's a good point about I can I can imagine how it might be challenging to navigate that uh when it comes to gender and identity and then a space titled woman made so um kind of curious uh how can that be remedied or kind of helped? I know that's a big question and I don't want to just narrow it at you, but like, you know, anyone else who can kind of speak on this too. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think um, if I'm honest, the name is, was a little hard for me to swallow. Um, and I think that it's super important to have like affinity spaces for women specifically and femme people. Um, I think this show in particular, because it is like about a topic that all kinds of bodies um, can relate to, it maybe is like, I don't know. I think that it, like this specific show, um, like the pool maybe could be like could have been expanded. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have an affinity space. Um, but yeah, the the name of the gallery was a little bit hard for me, if I'm honest. Yeah, I've definitely as I've worked with the team at Woman Made, I know a lot of people have said this similar thing. And going into during the show, I spent a lot of time grappling with that same idea. Like it really sat with me a lot of how can I make this show more expanded, like you were saying. And for me, it was the words I used. So using terms like vulvar bodies rather than female bodies, right? And I think medicine has a lot to do to catch up to where various artists and thinkers are with vocabulary, because I think that that's really important. And I try to be very intentional with my vocabulary in terms of writing the exhibition statement. So people would feel good about submitting their work because I was so aware of the gallery name and that's not something I can change, right? Um, but then also I just think it's important to have people in the space, right? Um, there's a really good amount of artists in the show who are of non-binary and trans identities and having their work and voices present in this show was my best approach of remedying the things I couldn't change, right? 
Um, so I don't know. I think it's, it's just critical to just be present, right? Like when you said that you feel great about being in this talk and being here, that literally made me tear up a little bit because, you know, claiming space and being in a space is so powerful in itself. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn it to Corey in terms of like the future of women made, because I can't answer those things. But in terms of this particular show, I think that was how I tried to go about it. Yeah, I appreciate you guys sharing that. Um, this is a question I was going to save for the end, kind of talking about how Woman Made can like further support um, women and non-binary artists and trans artists. Um, Kit, you kind of touched on it, but uh, yeah, the name is is right there in your face, you know. So, um, but yeah, being uh, aware of the kind of language that Kelsey was using in the call you could tell it was definitely intentional um and uh yeah I think that's just something to look out for in the future you know and to really be intentional about um but okay we're we're gonna kind of switch uh uh topics here but I kind of want to talk more about Kelsey specifically what your thoughts were behind choosing each one of these four artists and their pieces and kind of what stuck out to you and why you wanted to kind of initiate this conversation as a whole yeah so really two things your artist statements and then also the material all of your works are so unique materially. And I did want to spend some a good amount of time in this talk just going in on your process and how you make things. Um, because I know I was talking to Mackenzie at the opening and I had no idea that there was hair dye involved. And Kit's piece, that woodworking is, when I saw it, like my, my mouth literally dropped, my jaw dropped. Um, I'm not a woodworker and it's just so impressive. And then same with Joanna and Sarah, like we have works across the spectrum of medium. So I would just love to dive in if each of you could take some time talking about the material of the work and how you went about creating the piece. Um, I just thought that you would all be really interesting in conversation in that way. Um, well, I can say for me, it's not my first time doing photography, but it's my first time approaching photography in this kind of my initial thought was a camp style. Um, the photo, a lot of people I did not realize until afterwards, they assumed everything was done in post during editing that um, it was all photoshopped in, including all the dye, but I did all of it in camera. Um, like I, I grew my hair out for like eight months um, and then I bleached it and I dyed it, which was something I think I don't know if anyone else can relate to, but I've kind of always thought about it. I was like, what if, what if? Um, I also used to have that feeling before I shaved my head and then I did and it felt so good. And those kind of things like put me in tune with myself. Um, but it's also like a commitment to it. Um, then I shaved like in camera, the little lawnmower is a mini dollhouse lawnmower. Um, so... I also have to like accept that like the dimensions and the size are going to be what they are. I can't edit it much further. Um, I think for me, that blending is so important because I paint also, but I didn't want this like image that I make to be painted. Um, I wanted there to be this blend of reality and then also this like, we want to call it comedy or whatever, that's fine. Um, I think if it was entirely painted, if it was entirely illustrated, you wouldn't feel as personally related to it. But because you know that that's a real body there, that that's a photo of a real body, even if the rest of it doesn't seal, seem real, then there's still like this connection there. Um, but you're softening the blow because of how unrealistic it is. Um, it was new for me. I definitely think each piece that I do, I'm kind of like developing a new style and I feel really good about what this one has accomplished. Um, that might be most of it. I'd like to follow uh, Mackenzie's as a fellow photographer. Um, and I hope you kind of relate to this, that people think that photography is kind of like an instantaneous method of working, especially digitally. 
but um knowing and I kind of I don't know if it's because I'm a photographer like I could tell that this was like done in camera and knowing like how much time it took you to get to this point with that like I think that's part of the ah, that is part of the photographic artistic process that happens way before even like when you like push the shutter button um so I think that's great um and I really do enjoy that and I find that a lot in my work uh too as a photographer because I work in um very analog and experimental processes. Uh, so the technique that I'm using for this is called a lumen print. So it uses traditional black and white darkroom paper, but instead of exposing it to white light, it exposes it to UV light. Um, and with that, I don't know the science behind it necessarily, but with that, it makes um, kind of these range of blue, purple, and pink tones um, within them, depending on the paper. And I've done a lot of research and kind of trial and error of my own, finding out which specific papers give me the richest pink colors, uh, because I like using that color aspect to reference kind of femininity. Um, also, I just love pink as a color, but I also think the shades that I get are sometimes, you could kind of call this probably like a bubblegum pink, and I feel like that color palette is inviting. Um, but then when you get closer to it and you are like kind of reading and kind of digesting like what the text is, you're kind of being like, oh, this seems a little uncomfortable. How am I grappling with this? That's kind of how I'm um, thinking about using the materials with it and being using photography in a more hands on way. I definitely relate to that. I think that being able to kind of see that there was a process behind a photo in the photo makes it I it makes it less of you just viewing it and you can start to think of like being a part of it Sarah I have a follow-up question for you um there's such a rich hem uh, history of text-based artwork in feminist art do you use a lot of text in your practice I do. Um, so I also consider myself a writer. And I know you said fangirl of me. I'm entirely a fangirl of you also, because in addition to my um, Master of Fine Arts, I join a Women and Gender Studies certificate. So I have a lot of like, very kind of like research based papers and stuff going into it. And I love extremely long wordy things. Um, and I think um, one, that's the academic side, but when I started transitioning that into my work, it was more of like, I did not want to be misconstrued at all. I didn't want other people to be able to say like certain things about my body or my health and kind of like just wanting to have more of a voice in it and not being abstract because I wasn't at a point where I was like comfortable letting in other people into a certain aspect of my work yet. I wanted to be like, this is very hyper specific to me. This is what I'm saying. But as I'm working with this now, I'm kind of like pulling, I guess like shortening down a lot of these very wordy things into more abstract, but still kind of in your face phrases like that and leaving them open to more interpretation um, by an audience. Like, I mean, obviously the title of this piece gives you some context, but like I could be saying this to anyone or anyone can kind of be like receiving this message. And even though it's rooted in my personal experiences, it has the ability to kind of like branch off um, with that. I hope that answered the question. I'm curious too, this kind of relationship between printmaking and photography within your practice. Um, for me, print is always just such a visceral human medium um why printmaking for you so I guess I wouldn't consider this do you mean like printmaking as like a medium in like lithography and things like that uh because I honestly I have no idea how to do any of that stuff mm -hmm. um this was done entirely in darkroom and I actually just laser cut these letters out of mat board um and then layered them over it. So no, I unfortunately do not have any of the traditional printmaking techniques. I would love to get into it because I know there's a lot of overlap there, especially with like screen printing and how you expose the screens in a certain light um, to kind of like take out the negative space or whatnot. So maybe this is just like my 
desire to branch into those other fields. Yeah, I definitely, I don't know when I, when I saw your work, I just was like, I could see you doing so many text-based prints and all different types of mediums. Um, so that's really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, so if we could hear from, let's do Kit. Um, I sort of just love like collecting wood everywhere I go. Um, so I've been hanging on to this little tiny chunk of cherry burl for like 10, more than 10 years. Um, and often when I'm sculpting, I like, Sometimes I have a very clear idea of what I want to make. Um, and sometimes I don't. In this piece, I didn't. Um, in both of those circumstances, uh, the material, like the actual piece of wood, really like informs the shape. Um, this piece, I just kind of started carving and this is what came out. Um, yeah, and I like... I didn't really put together until afterwards, like the kind of like play on words with like cherry wood and like, I don't know, cherry generally like is sometimes a word used like for in response, like around vulvas. Um, and then wood is also like, I don't know, an interesting word for genitalia. So I just thought it was like a little bit funny and kind of fit. I have a question, Kit. How did you get this extremely glossy finish on the wood? Lots of sanding. <laughs> um, there's finish on it too, but generally it's, uh, yeah, a lot of sanding, like going up in grit. Um, I've realized that I, it's like very therapeutic for me to like take something really rough and like turn it into something very smooth. Um, this piece, when I had it like on my dining room table for a little while and a couple of friends came over, like it's very hard to not touch it. Um, it feels very good when you do touch it. I like kind of wanted to say like, you can touch it. Um, but I wasn't actually sure to, I didn't want it to get messed up. Um, but yeah. That's how I did it. And so I just have a question. So when you were making it, you had no intention of making it what it ended up being? Or did you have a little bit of an idea? I'm just curious. Um, With this particular piece, I, I did like, I basically was like, I want to carve something today. And what pieces of wood do I have? And so I looked through all my wood and I was like, I want to carve something with this cherry burl. I've had this for so long. Like what shape is here? And then I started sort of thinking about it and um, carved it based on the wood. So I didn't like just, like there was some intention there, but it was very like specific to this piece of material. Oftentimes I'll like, make a sketch and decide what I want to make. And then I'll go select wood and see how, how that fits like the piece. Um, this piece was more just kind of came out. I'm curious too, Kate, obviously I said, I don't know much about wood um, besides a few ventures into the, the wood shop. Um, but is there anything specific about cherry wood in terms of like the color and the feel of it in the grain um I mean yeah it's like it's a wood that's commonly used for furniture because it's a uh, hard wood which uh, hard wood means like it has like really tight grain so you can get that like um super smooth um finish on it and it's um it like has a beautiful color like red hue um and generally like this piece is a burl so it's like uh kind of like a growth on a tree it's like um 
actually was looking this up because someone asked me what a burl was and I was like, I don't actually know what a burl is. And when I looked it up, it, like basically nobody really knows what a burl is. It's kind of like a growth. Maybe it's like a, a wound that healed or like a new um, branch was trying to come out, but it makes this like really kind of you, like very beautiful kind of cool grain pattern. That's um, yeah, it's just. So is it like kind of a heavy piece? Like, is it kind of dense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hard, yeah. It's hardwoods generally are like a lot denser. And Wow. That makes it sit so much differently for me now. Thank you. <laughs> Even with, uh, with the definition or maybe loose definition of what a burl is, it's kind of poetic in what the piece is. It's kind of cool. I feel like something that like kind of came out in like a kind of happy art way was um, I started kind of carving the general shape. And then as I got to the edge, um, that kind of like gnarled like little edge was sort of like a happy surprise. I didn't um, I wasn't sure how that was going to be. I wasn't sure if I was going to want to like kind of carry it around like the carving part around or um, but it felt a little to me sort of like this um soft kind of like smooth like beautiful thing in the middle of this kind of like gnarled um kind of hair light like there's like some sort of hair resemblance I think um anyways yeah yeah that's awesome thanks for sharing um, next up, we have Joanna. Hey, yeah, so, um, so this piece, I don't know if we want to make it a little bit bigger, but it's, um, it's actually an embroidered drawing. And so there are two sides to this piece. There's the side that, um, that we're seeing right now that has sort of this anatomy spread wide and then there's actually the back of the piece which is a symmetrical floral embroidery that's kind of acting on this anatomy in a really sort of messy way um and so I've, I've worked on kind of a series of these embroidered drawings over time and really thought about like the materiality and like what you know the symbolism of of thread um you know, previously, like embroidery, cross stitch, all of this has kind of been relegated to the idea of like women's work of like a lesser craft of something that's kind of done behind the scenes, that's functional. Um, and so pulling that into these compositions and pulling it into the space of the gallery, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say that it's something worth looking at. It's something worth um, considering. Um, and so like with this series too, I also think about thread and its potential, you know, as like sutures. So in order to heal something, you know, in order to mend it and pull it together, we have to pierce it. And so there's an analogy to healing and sometimes what we have to do in order to heal. Um, additionally, like with the materials in this piece, um, I'm also thinking about, you know, what what we present to the world, um, the sort of idealized self and what's really inside. Our bodies are messy, you know, they're fleshy, there's a lot going on and and that's all kind of behind the scenes. And so part of what I'm doing in this composition is trying to elevate that, is trying to slow people down in order to look at it and really see it and kind of ask questions about what's going on. Um, so those are just a couple of the ideas that, you know, I'm thinking about as I'm kind of putting this piece together. Joanne, I have a question for you. How do you embroider on, is this, this is paper, right? Paper. Yeah. Without tearing <laughs> the paper. Yeah. Um, so it's really just about kind of spacing out like the holes in the embroidery. Um, and so you really just have to do a little bit of planning to make sure that you're not putting like where you're puncturing too close together so that the thread pulls through. But like in terms of the materials, you're also using maybe like a little bit heavier weight of a paper. So like a Reeves BF BFK or a Strathmore and using like a thread that 
you know, I'm, I'm taking um, just embroidery floss and I'm typically like splitting it in half so that I get a smaller kind of, I don't know if diameter is the right word, but a smaller number of threads that I'm using in these pieces. So that kind of helps it maintain like the integrity on the paper and not sort of like pull through. That just made me realize that I really picked artists that do use mediums that I know nothing about. <laughs> this has been amazing you guys are such experts of your craft I it's been great hearing and learning from you yeah thank you awesome thank you guys for sharing um so I know Joanna you make work um kind of about motherhood and about parenthood and I know Kit um you are also a parent so I kind of want to ask you guys how does parenthood um influence your guys's work maybe if we could have kate go first <laughs> um yeah i mean being a parent and just like being being a birth parent um influences so much about my like life and journey and everything. Um, I think like being, becoming a parent and being pregnant was like a very big turning point in my life um, in terms of my gender story. Um, I think being pregnant, feeding my kids was like sort of the thing that pushed my gender dysphoria like right off the edge. Um, and I've got like really complicated feelings about it all, right? It's, um, yeah, it was just like a very like complicated thing for me. Um, also having kids like plays such a big role in my own story. And the, um, I think like there was a time when I sort of felt like I can wait. I, I started to transition um, post having children. And I think there was a time when I thought, okay, I like, this is something that I need, but I can wait until my kids are adults. Like, I don't want to take their mother. It's like, you know, lots of kind of things like this. Um, and then I realized that like, you know, my kids are going to like know me better than anybody. Like we're family and they're going to see me. And I didn't want them to have an example of like me not like uh, being authentic and putting everybody else's joy above my own. Um, and I wanted them to feel like they could live it without shame. Um, and as it turns out, I have a kid with who's gender expansive. Um, so the whole, like everything has just been really affirming, um, of how important it is to live authentically. And that's like, it's just such a theme in like all of my work. Yeah, I think for me coming from somewhat of a different experience, um, I'm non-binary and I'm child-free. Um, but I'm the same age right now that my mother was when she had me. And I think kind of coming to this inflection point and realizing like sort of the potential and like the limits of the biology that I was born with, um, it really kind of, you know, tipped me into this space of wanting to look at parenthood, of wanting to look at like the societal messages, messages that we spin around parenthood, you know, kind of saying, um, you know, if you're born with uterus, like, you know, having a kid, this is the best thing that you can ever do. This is what you were made for. Um, and so, you know, choosing something that is not sort of in line with that message, I think it just made me curious about um, just about like the the whole process. And also, I think really curious about, you know, this this potential that I might not really explore in my lifetime, but it, that I think is just such a beautiful and like crazy thing that our bodies can do, 
Um, so yeah, I'm, a lot of my work right now and, and, you know, kind of focuses in on, you know, what are the messages that we give people? And also really, especially in today's political climate, kind of focuses in on, you know, the, the sort of, um, the rights that we give or don't give people with respect to, to reproduction. Um, and so that, that space, yeah, continues to feel really fraught and really rich. And that makes me really continue to want to explore it, I guess. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. Um, Kelsey, did you have any comments that you wanted to share? No, I think just this conversation around birthing and parenthood, like you noted, um, Joanna, is really an intersectional issue. Um, I think it's important to, I know this was one of our questions that we haven't gotten to yet, but kind of on this topic of birthing and thinking about gynecology and medical systems and all the inequality that exists there, um, something that I've really been shocked to discover is how many medical providers don't know about the extremely violent racist history of gynecology. Um, and even things like the speculum, right? Thinking about that almost as a sculpture and the weight that that carries. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but the speculum is attributed to the quote unquote father of gynecology. Uh, J. Marion Sims, who did experiments without surgical experiments without anesthesia on enslaved black women. Um, and he still has monuments up in our country today, um, which is just crazy. But thinking about just bringing those those histories to light, I think is really important to understand how and why things persist today, right? Like the maternal a uh, mortality rate amongst Black women or not believing pain when it comes to Black patients, things like that. It's really critical to understand the histories and how they butt up against these medical institutions. And there's an artist named Doreen Gardner who works a lot on these histories. So I implore everyone to look at Doreen's work. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It kind of got off tangent, but I think that art has such an important place when it comes to critiquing institutions. And I think biology and science specifically have been, they exist as these things that we don't really question, right? But I think artists and art students have such power in their ability to ask questions. And I think that we really, really need those questions now. And yeah, just keep, keep asking questions, you guys, and keep up with your research and keep showing your work and sharing your stories. It's just so important. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of questions, um, what are some things or maybe one thing that you all want audiences to understand after seeing this show and also after listening to this panel? I could go. Um I guess the one thing that I would like audiences to um, think about is that an any body can have a vulva. Um, not every individual has the same definition of what a vulva is and what a vulva looks like. Um, like the vocabulary that someone uses to describe their genitals doesn't necessarily have to match this like, like two two ways that society sees bodies. Um, and also just that like bodies are incredible. I was really excited about this show specifically because the title was down there and that felt like it was really broad. And I was optimistic that it would mean a broad range of art that wasn't explicitly only vaginas or vulvas. And it could be about how people's down there's interact with one another. It could be all these different things. And I was really optimistic for that. I struggled. And I think maybe this is more a question for myself connecting with an audience to know how to describe that to other people when I was telling them, oh, I'm going to be in this show. It's called Down There. Um, it's not, it's about, and then 
like when I'm jokingly like talking with my friends and their partners, their partner's like, so, so what's your piece? And I'm like, and they'd be like, oh, it's her vagina. I'd be like, well, it's not, it is, but it's not. And like the works in the show are, but they aren't. And like, you should, you should look at it. And that's really the point of the whole exhibition is these are things we should feel comfortable looking at. Everyone's comfort levels are different and certainly boundaries are appropriate, but also like art is meant to push those things. And I think that's what I'm still working with, a question for myself and for like an audience is where do you find that middle? There's especially like what my piece was is how do I make these things feel approachable, but still show them something that they didn't want to look at originally? I agree with that. Um, and kind of following then and that idea of the uncomfortableness that comes with these things and not shying away from doing that. I think in my piece specifically, something I don't want to shy away from is like there is a lot of anger and bitterness that exists within people. Um, I don't know where this, I guess at least in my particular instance, like with sexual pain. And again, that itself is an incredibly broad topic. Obviously mine deals specifically like with vaginismus um, but even just like the anger that exists in the medical field and how gender discriminatory and sexist it is. Um, and obviously not letting that like consume your entire like soul and body to an unhealthy extent, but like understanding that like to get to these very like uplifting points, you have to kind of have like endured a lot of um, your own discomfort and own kind of like rage with that and like letting um, both of those things kind of like play out with one another. Yeah, that's a really powerful sentiment. Um, I think there's a lot of power in embracing all of the pieces of who we are, especially those pieces that are socially stigmatized, that are, you know, um, made to feel like we can't talk about them. Um, that stuff, when it's not explored and talked about, becomes you know, if you're, you know, at all interested in young becomes a part of like our shadow, right? Something that we kind of carry around this sort of heavy unspoken. So when we get to explore, when we get to play in this space of like the taboo, um, I think we give people permission, other people permission to do that too, and to ask questions, their own questions about the space. So, you know, I think if there's a takeaway, just that you know, all of those parts of you, no matter how messy, are beautiful and worth witnessing and, and talking about. Yeah, I think for me, that's the overarching thing is just literally pulling back veils and destigmatizing and just bringing all these conversations to light. Um, I think so much darkness can exist when we're afraid to talk about things. Um, and that's basically my main hope. And the other one would just be, it's been amazing to see how many sexual educators, um, psychologists, physical therapists, gynecologists, and people in the medical field have been interacting with this show. And honestly, I view the show as public health and I view all of you as doing public health. And something I'm super passionate about is just dismantling boundaries between medicine, science, and the arts and humanities. And I think the show is doing that, right? You can see these boundaries between gynecology and art and feminist art and, and med medicine and science are so blurred. And I'm just really, really excited for the people of different careers that have been in the same room together talking about these things. Um, because I think, like I said before, artists have such power in advancing science and medicine and from the words we use to the way we treat patients to the research that gets funded, all those things. So I just, I hope that we leave this show being like artists are powerful and artists are public health and science, public health educators and scientists, right? Um, just kind of breaking down those boundaries. I think science and medicine needs art more than ever. Yeah. And, and just to quickly build off of what Kelsey was saying, we've had a lot of sex therapists, we have a lot of pelvic floor therapists um, come through and be really uh, touched by the show. 
and to know that they're going back and talking to their clients and and people who can relate to the things that y'all are going through is really, really special. So I know that I can say on behalf of the staff at Woman Made, we're really, really grateful to have you guys part of the history of Woman Made and of feminist history as a whole. Um, but yeah, that kind of uh, uh, puts a cap on our panel today. I'm really, really grateful for you guys coming today. Um, I hope that you guys can walk away with something valuable. Um, but yeah, stay connected with Woman Made. We would love to see you guys' faces again. Um, and yeah, so thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>